going to kick it off first with Amy Kocheck. Again, her presentation is called From a Desire to a Destiny, How to Shift Your Part-Time Dream to a Full-Time prof Profitable Career. Uh, Amy, to tell you a little about her, she is a writing coach, speaker, a ghostwriter. Uh, she has helped business leaders, students, and entrepreneurs create engaging content by removing mental barriers in the writing process. She has published over 25 books, um, and she's worked with some big names such as Kevin, ha Kevin Harrington, the original uh, shark from Shark Tank, Forbes Riley, who was an author, speaker, and TV host, and Caleb Maddox, the 18-year-old millionaire. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Amy. Uh, go ahead and take it away. Hi, everyone. It is so, so good to be here. Um, I just, first of all, want to thank the Hoth um, for allowing me to be here today, for inviting me here. Um, special thanks to Michaela for making this happen. This is such like a full circle moment, and what I'll be talking about today has a lot to do with self-awareness, um, really knowing who you are and what you want. But I remember coming to a, a HothCon, I believe it was like two or three years ago, and I remember sitting in the audience thinking, it would be so great to speak at the Hoth, to speak at HothCon. And that it just started as a thought, right? Like thinking, what a great opportunity. And then I just kind of let it go, just put that thought and that those words out into the universe. And here I am. I don't remember if it was two or three years later, but two to three years later, here I am on the virtual stage in front of all of you. And I feel extremely, extremely grateful and uh, honestly surprised because I don't know how I got here, um, which is something that I'm gonna talk a lot about today. Now, I wanna prepare you for something because I know a lot of times when we come to conferences and we come to seminars and it's very much strategy driven and I am going to give you strategy but I also want you to just pause for a minute and I want you to realize that this next hour, the spotlight is on you. Even though I'm here and I'm gonna be talking to you and I'm gonna be guiding you, I want you to understand that all the things that you are desiring require the spotlight to be on you. So if you feel like I'm getting in your business a little bit or I'm calling you out, um, I'm really calling myself out. And if you hear barking in the background, that's my dog. I I needed someone to watch her. I didn't do my due diligence. So if you hear in the background, just, just ignore her. She likes her voice to be heard, but she's in the other room. So I want to talk, I'm gonna pull up a PowerPoint. I'm gonna be pulling up a few things. Um, so let me share my screen. My tech savviness is not like at the highest level. So if I, if it looks a little strange, just listen to my words. That's the thing that matters the most, right? Technology, they're just pictures. So um, where did it go? Okay. So I want to, I'm just going to half show it. I don't need it to be, or maybe I need it to be full screen. Okay, let me stop talking to myself. So I am, I am focusing today on those of you in here, which I know that um, you all are writers, the majority of you are writers, um, that there is a creative nature within all of you. And there's something that you all have to offer the world. And there's a desire to, to use that on whatever scale that you want to use that. And I'm going to anchor this with my story first, and then I'm going to transition into some best practices that I've used that have just kind of taken me from thought to actually putting this into practice and to utilizing this into an actual business. Um, oh, there it is. Oh, God, this technological genius. Okay, here we go. So um, my business is called Amy Kocheck Creative, and I'll kind of get into why I use that and what that means. But first, I want to start um, by introducing you to my hero. This is, um, I, I start all of my speaking engagements every time I share about what I do, the power of story. I always start with my hero, who is my dad. 
And just to give you a little bit of context of who my dad is and who he was and all of the magical things about him, I, um, my roots were in story. My dad used to read to us every night and he was one of those like great readers, you know, like did the voices and like um, used hand motions, like really brought us in to story. And because of that, I started to really have a love for the power of writing and the power of story. And to reduce writing to strategies, to reduce writing to mere technique, and to reduce writing to just a career minimizes the power of what you have in your hands when you actually sit down to write. Writing is prayer. Writing is one of the deepest creative expressions that you can tap into. And when you unlock writing to be at that level, you give yourself permission to take this craft and to let it breathe, to take this craft for yourself and let it speak to you and decide what is it that this writing does for me and how can I use this to service, first of all, myself and to service the world around, around me. Now, this might sound very, and I hate using the word woo-woo, but as I get into this, I'm going to tell you, I have adopted this to every area of my life and have seen this flow abundance into my life in more ways than one. The lowest level being a business and an income, and I can pay my rent, and I can do things that I love. But on the other end of that is fulfillment that I never thought was possible and power that I never knew was inside of me through just using the power of story. So with my dad, my dad was a very, very unique, and I'm going to show you, these are two of my very favorite pictures of my dad. On the left, as you can see, that's my dad on a bike. Now, if you look at his clothing, that was the way that my dad dressed on a regular. This was not like a costume. My dad wore very bright colors, like he viewed the world with excitement and wonder. Everything was magical to him. Um, so that's one of my favorite pictures. On the right-hand side was him blowing bubbles in his kitchen. And this was about, he was like 67 at this age, uh, this picture. And this was not a out of the norm. When I would come home to visit him at 32 years old, he would have a new book at his house that he wanted me to read. One of the most unique and creative individuals. Now, if you look at the middle, the middle is a picture of an outline of my dad's book. My dad, since, since I was 13 years old, and I'm 37 now, so since I was 13 years old, my dad had been talking about his desire of writing a book. He loved writing. He wanted to release his writing. And I remember he would sit at the kitchen table, and he would just write little paragraphs, and, but it never really amounted to anything. That It was just kind of like stayed in his journal, and it always was a desire of his to do something with. So I remember a year before my dad passed away, we were sitting in his kitchen and we were talking about his book. And of course, like I do this for a living. So I'm like, dad, what, let's talk about your book. What do you want to do with it? How do you like, how do you want to show up with your story? What, how can we outline this? So we sat at the kitchen table and we outlined his entire book. So there's three pages of this that I actually still have. And I laminated because it's become so special to me. But I remember sitting there and we outlined his book. And um, I came home for Christmas that year. So it was six months later. And I was like, dad, how's that book coming? Because we had outlined it, right? And it was like, here's all the things that you need to write. How's that book coming? And he was like, well, um, you know, I've been busy. And I was like, yeah, I get it. Understandable. But how's that book coming? And it just kind of stayed on this piece of paper. And it didn't, nothing happened after that. And then six months later, um, my dad got into a motorcycle accident and then ended up passing away of a traumatic brain injury. So the only thing that I have left of my dad's story is this outline. And I say all that to say that something happened to me when I started cleaning out my dad's stuff and found this piece of paper. And I was thinking about how in this outline are so many bits of nuggets and gems and things that were meant to be shared that never were able to be shared. And that all that I have of my dad's story is just this mere outline. And it made me think of how many other people 
are sitting on stories or they're sitting on talents or they're sitting on this like deep desire within them that says there is so much more that I have that I want to offer that I want to communicate and for one reason or another and the reasons that they're, sometimes they're great reasons. Sometimes they're not even excuses, but for one reason or another, they lie dormant inside of us, which is then a thought of like, how many stories, how, mu how many fiction, nonfiction, blogs, how much, how many just random content that could be put out into the universe that is not for one reason or another. So all of that led me, um, led me down a very unique journey. So I'm going to give you a little bit of my history. So I grew up in a very, very strict religious environment. My strict religious environment, um, it's, it, it borders on cults. Cults don't call themselves cults, but this was a cult. And I spent about 33 years in this strict religious environment. And I remember I was asked to, um, to teach a lesson on integrity, which as we all know, integrity is just the essence of being the person you are on the outside as you are on the inside, having those two match. So I go about to, um, to teach this lesson and I taught it the first time and people were like, oh, we loved it. So that year I ended up teaching this same lesson. I taught it eight or nine times in a year. I kept being asked to teach it. And people were saying, go, oh, this is a book. You need to write a book. I had no desire to write a book. At the time I was teaching high school English. I felt comfortable in my life. There was no reason to write a book. I was just being asked to teach. But every time I taught, I found that my story kept developing and how I was teaching it developed. So I remember I was, um, it was a random day. It was nothing special. I remember waking up at three o'clock in the morning. And when I woke up at three o'clock in the morning, I remember opening my laptop and I'm getting ready to write this book. And if you look on the right, that's, that's the book cover. That's the title of the book. It's no longer available. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, but I woke up at three o'clock in the morning and I just started typing. And what, what initially was supposed to be this self-help story, or the self-help book about integrity and how to be, how to be more um, in line with who you really are, started to become more memoir-based. And what happened was it's, in the middle of the night and I'm typing up pieces of my story that I have, I had lived. It, it was no, it was no new information, but it was almost like my story started to play on a reel in front of me. And as I'm reading this story of my life, I'm realizing, God, I have lost myself that I have been in this environment that requires outward perfection. You have to look a certain way. You have to talk a certain way. You got to present a certain way. So as I'm typing this story, I'm letting things flow out of me that I had never told anyone or parts of me that I had hidden. And it was like, as these words start coming out on the page, I'm crying. I'm feeling all the emotions of it. And I combined my memoir with some of the teaching that I had done with the, in, with the lesson on integrity. So now I have a book. I don't know what to do. I don't know about publishing books. I didn't even know about writing books. I'm just sitting there writing. I'm using the opportunity of writing to just guide me. So now I have a manuscript. So now I'm like, oh, well, I should self-publish. I don't know how to self-publish. So I go on YouTube and watch all these videos on how to self-publish. And then... I think, well, I don't know how to design a book cover. So then I contract some, so I'm just gathering. I'm just, what you will find is that when you are in the midst of trying to build something that's so genuinely connected to you, the how takes care of itself. So I start to get connected to people and I release this book. Too many reviews, obviously, because I had really shared a lot of personal things and not everybody was, was down with that. Not everybody supported that. But what I discovered was that when I wrote my story and when I released it, it was like something inside of me shifted. And two years after that, it took me two years, but two years after that, I decided that I wanted to start, I wanted to change my life. So I left the religious organization I was a part of. I left my teaching career behind. I moved to St. Pete with only clothes in my car in a 
in a small Ford Escort and I arrived here in St. Pete. And what I have discovered in the process of all of this is that there's so much power in your story and the way that you use your story to communicate to other people and especially the way that you use your story if you want to build some sort of writing business or if you want to use your writing capabilities on a larger scale to do it more full time. So I wanna talk about this a little bit. So when, we, when we're focusing on the mode of writing, the writing that takes you from writing for other people to really figuring out what do I wanna write how do I want to show up as a writer? What do I want my end goal to be as a writer? The first thing that you have to realize is that good writing and writing that is powerful and writing that makes a difference is so intricately connected to self-awareness. A lot of times we're looking for strategies and we're looking for things outside of ourselves but understanding that really great writing comes from a very intimate connection with yourself. Because when you are writing, I always say, like I said before, writing is prayer. And however you are writing, what you are doing is you are becoming almost like a channel. You are channeling something into your writing. Because when someone opens up your book or someone reads your blog or someone sees your content on social media, the thing that makes writing powerful is that you make me feel something, right? Facts only go so far. Information only goes so far. Think about when you're reading a textbook, right? If I'm reading a textbook, normally it's not like, wow, I'm so impacted by this, you know? It's usually great information. I'm taking notes. And a lot of times I'll forget it. But the thing, about, the thing about connecting with emotions is the thing that makes us remember is our emotions. I can guarantee that some of your strongest memories are strong because of the emotions you have attached to them. It's because there was some sort of feeling in that moment. So when you understand that when you approach writing, you approach it in a way that says, how do I want my reader to feel? What is the journey of emotion? I'm not taking them on a mind journey. I'm taking them on an emotion journey. What is it about this that I want to infuse into my reader? But here's the catch. The writing that you are putting out into the world to teach, to change, to impact, it has to change and impact you first. You are the first learner of your writing. You are the first reader of your writing. So if you're writing and you don't feel anything, if you're writing and it's just a matter of you typing on a keyboard and you're just getting words out and there's no connection to it, it's a very disconnected process, know that your reader is going to have that same experience. When your writing costs you something, I always tell my writers this, when you write and you need to take a break, that's great because that means you went there and you allowed it to cost you something. You allowed your words to take you to a place that maybe was emotional or uncomfortable or vulnerable, but that's why we even read. We read because we want to feel something. We want so we want to whatever that feeling is and as a writer you determine that. So one of the first things that you need to know is that there's already a gatekeeper with all of us. Anytime we're reading something, there's a gatekeeper that is filtering those things. That's coming to whatever it is that you're reading and looking at it in a almost like a judgmental manner or to have our guards up, right? We all have a gatekeeper. We all have something that keeps that we feel keeps us safe. So it's the same thing with your reader. So when you're writing, it's like removing that gatekeeper and telling your reader you're safe here. Because you know what makes people feel safe is when you're writing to them and they're saying yes as you're writing. They're saying, God, I'm not crazy. Yes, I resonate with that. Yes, I feel that she is speaking directly to me. She is writing to me. And the power of that comes when you remove your own gatekeeper. 
when you sit down to write and you're not thinking about how inadequate you are, when you sit down to write and you're not comparing yourself with everyone else, when you sit down to write and, and think, I, everyone's already said this, there's no point in releasing it. Well, obviously, they, there's, no, there's nothing new under the sun. It's been said before, right? But the thing that makes your writing unique is you because nobody on the earth is like you. You have the unique fingerprint of your writing, which means you bring your experiences, you bring your trauma, you bring your triumphs, you bring the uniqueness of you. So when you sit down, you're removing the gatekeeper that brings down into your mind that makes writing so taxing, that makes writing so focused on overthinking and makes you feel like I'm going to forever be writing for everyone else. Or I'm going to forever feel like my writing is not good enough. I'm forever going to be reading everybody else's writing and have the dream of man, if only. The way that you do that is when you approach your writing, remove your own gatekeeper. And you say, this is an opportunity for me to, first of all, be vulnerable with myself. Because disconnected writing creates disconnected readers. So you find a space for your writing. And I always say, when you sit down, if you have a spiritual practice, right? I remember in, in church when we used to have to pray. God, we were always praying. But it was like, when you had a moment for prayer, you had to have like a certain time of the day. You had to have like a journal by you. You had to have a Bible by you, the, put music in the background. Some people would light candles because you understood that it was a sacred practice that you were approaching a practice that was sacred. So you had to set up the stage to understand, I'm about to tap into something deep because I'm about to pray. And prayer is simply you becoming vulnerable with yourself. It's just strict vulnerability. So the same thing if you think about yoga, you think about meditation, you think about doing affirmations or chanting or being out in nature. There's something sacred about those moments, right? And a lot of times it's set up, if you go to a, a yoga studio, it's set up for you to remove your gatekeeper. Music's low, you know, the, the, the temperature is making you comfortable. All of it is a stage for you to get in contact with yourself. So when we're talking about removing the gatekeeper, what are you putting into your writing routine that's allowing you to remove the gatekeeper? So if your writing routine is when I feel like it or... I got to open my computer screen and there's noise, the dog's barking, the kids are around. And I'm like, I just got to get this out. It becomes very neurotic and it becomes very head knowledge, which once again, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you know that you have deep, deep knowledge, you have deep experiences that you want to share on a deeper level, then you create a space that allows you to remove your own gatekeeper and, and say, what is it? that I want to communicate, first of all, to myself, and then what is it that I want to share on a larger scale with other people? So that's the first step, really creating a space for your writing routine that allows you to get really clear and to get into a mode of understanding. This is a sacred practice, and this is a sacred moment. And this is something that I really had to teach myself because my roots are, I was a high school English teacher, as I said, for seven years. So my, my mindset of writing was five paragraph essay, attention getter, bridge sentences, thesis, three body paragraphs, conclusion, very methodical, right? So when I sat down to write, and especially at, at the beginning when I, was, um, when I was writing for other people, it just became like a, let me put this together, let me look at strategies, and let me make sure that this reads well nothing wrong with that. But things really started to shift when I started ghostwriting for people. Because the job of a good ghostwriter is that when you're writing for someone else, you have to write as if you are someone else. If I'm going to be a good ghostwriter, and I'll just, since I see your faces and names. So let's say that Chelsea, Chelsea Brinton, hires me to be her ghostwriter. Chelsea, I, I can be your ghostwriter. So if Chelsea has this amazing story and I'm going to be her ghostwriter, Chelsea gives me the information that she wants me to share. And I have one to two choices. One, I can take the information she wants me to share and use my writing talent and just, okay, pound this out. I'm just going to write it. 
And then I give it back to Chelsea. And what it is, is I now, Chelsea now has a book that is a list of events of her life and she can release it. Now, the problem with this is that that book then just becomes an account of someone's life. A it's just a list, right? Which then reads like a, like I'm watching Chelsea's life on CNN, right? Very new news based from this to this to this. But I realized that when I'm writing about Chelsea's story, it's not just a list of events. That Chelsea's story involves deep, deep emotions because that's what all of our stories involve. So in order for me to do Chelsea's story, the service that it deserves, I have to channel her, which means that as Chelsea's sharing her story, I have to feel what she's feeling. I have to be in those moments. I have to think like Chelsea. I have to, in the story, I have to move like Chelsea would move. I have to respond the way Chelsea would respond because that reads much different than just a list. So when I started ghostwriting, I started seeing like, there's so much power in connection to yourself when you write. It's a totally different experience. I remember ghostwriting for somebody and I gave them one of the chapters and it was a very, he was a businessman, straight facts, no, you know, no vulnerability. It's pretty rude. But I remember I was doing, I wrote one of his chapters and it was like, I studied him, not just a study of what is he showing me. I studied him underneath what he was showing me. I studied who he really was. So when I'm writing the chapter, I imagined I was him. So I'm like, okay, I'm him. He's like a businessman. So he has to present this really strong exterior, but I'm seeing underneath that there's a lot of sensitivity and maybe a little bit of insecurity. And I took a risk of writing in a very, in, in a much more emotional way. And I remember sending him the chapter and we did, um, we did a meeting afterwards to like a check-in with his feedback. And I remember he got so emotional. He had to pause a couple times because he was like, I've never read my story like this. I've never felt more seen and connected to myself because that is the power that occurs when you view writing as connection, connection to you, connection to other people. And it is a matter of channeling. You are a channeler. Now, when it comes to really getting clear with how you're writing for you and how you're showing up as a writer. You have to be so connected to who you are, what you believe, and how you live. And I'll explain this. So the first thing I call this value-based writing. Oh, and I included a picture of my dog because she's great. So that's Marley. She's in the other room. Um, so when we're talking value-based, these are my these are my values. So I have my top five values. And when I talk about values, everybody has core values that they're living by, even if you haven't identified them. And those are the things that are really important to you. Those are the things that matter. If you ever think about times in your life where you feel overwhelmed, you feel stressed out, or you feel upset, it's because you are living outside of your values. It's because something in your life, you have allowed in your life and you're living outside your values. So I'll give you a for instance. So one of my values is integrity, right? Which is so crazy because this is something I struggle with so much in my life is just genuinely being myself. So times in my life when I feel the most stressed or I feel the most out of alignment with myself is when I feel the pull of feeling like I need to be like somebody else or not feeling very confident in myself or feeling like um, I have to show up differently for other people. So when I find myself outside of my values, I show up differently as a writer. My writing is different because I'm living outside of my values. And I also, I pick up projects that I don't really want to do because, hey, it's money. Or the, the writing that I do is very disconnected and based in my stress and based in me just not feeling like me, but I got to have a deadline. So you have to understand that when you are writing and your writing has power to it, it's when you are in line with your values. So I would encourage you, first of all, to figure out what are my core values? 
because when I figure out my core values, I'll start to realize one, the things in my life that I know need to be in line for me to really get connected to myself, which makes my writing that much more effective. But it also is in the line with the things that you like to write about. Because the things that you value are the things that you are going to, that are going to have that much more power when you're writing because they're so closely connected to who you are. Can you guys see this? Or like, I have like, okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Now, once you, once you establish your core values, the next thing that I would challenge you to do um, in the course that I teach we have this whole section called, um, called your core message timeline. And your core message is essentially, what is the subject or subjects that you are most passionate about writing about? And here's the interesting part. Our core message is usually so intricately combined with our trauma. And I know that that's going to sound crazy, but I believe that your trauma and the most difficult points in your life, they're like your classroom. So I'm going to tell you the topic that I can talk the most about. I can talk all day, every day about integrity, all day, every day. My core message is embracing you, is integrity. Why? Because so many of the traumas in my life happened and they challenged my integrity. So because my life kept bringing me back to that, I'm a master. Because I life keeps trying to teach me more information about that. So usually the parts of our lives that we try to hide or try to put shame on or try to put guilt on of like, sweep that part of my life under the rug. Or that part's unsavory. Don't, don't share that part. But you know what's crazy? Those are the parts that we're usually tasked to share the most because those are the parts that are so intricately connected to us. Those are the parts that we've had to fight in private and in public. Those are the parts that keep us up at night and keep us going back within. So because of that, when you start looking at your life, especially when you're looking at three major transitions in your life, when you think about three things in your life, three major parts in your life, and usually those transitions are ones that sometimes cause us pain or even transitions that were triumphant. What happened in those transitions? What did you learn? And what is the recurring lesson that you keep being taught? Because the recurring lesson that you keep being taught is your core message. And when you discover your core message, you can build a world of content around that. We get ourselves locked into one form. We get ourselves locked into thinking being a great writer and being someone that can take this to a full-time level means I have to write one book and that book needs to be a New York Times bestseller and I need to be on the level of, you know, Tony Robbins or Lisa Nichols or, um, God, give me a not, I haven't read nonfiction in a while. Um, J.K. Rowling's, that was a good one. Um, I have to be on that level. That's the only way that I know that I'm successful as a writer. But the reality is when you discover your core message, what you'll do is you'll unlock your ability to write because now you can take this core message and break it down into subtopics. How can I take this and communicate it in a thousand different ways on five different platforms? How can I make this a podcast? How can I make this a blog? How can I make this a series that I can self-publish? How can I make this something that I can use on my social media and just dissect it? That's what the professionals are doing. They're taking little core messages that they have, that they've learned that are so intricately connected to them and their journey. And they've learned how to monetize it by taking the chains off of it and letting it breathe. I have taken so much of my trauma and the first thing I've done is I brought it into the light because what I realize is the thing that connects us all the most is that we're all struggling in some way or another. And that my trauma is not unique, that somebody else somewhere has experienced something that I've experienced. And the thing that makes writing so powerful is you are saying to yourself, I'm not alone. I'm not crazy. Let me let this content work on me. And now I'm going to release it to the masses. And what the masses are going to say is, God, thank you. 
Thank you for putting words to something that I don't have words for. That's the gift of what you have. Your gift is being able to take the, the pain that we have, the confusion that we have, the, the feeling of feeling lost, and you put words to something that I can't put words to because that's not my gift. But because you have that gift, now you are giving people the ability to read in front of them something that tells them you're not alone, you're not crazy, it's okay, and there's hope. That's a very powerful gift. And when you understand that you're not just a writer, right? We put like a title on it. And if we say you're a writer, that means that you can only do these things and you can only look like this and you can only have these type of careers. Hell no. You are, you are our channeler. You are a person who's been given the gift of taking the hard stuff, the hard parts of our world, the hard parts about being human, and you have the gift of being able to communicate it in only the way that you can. That's a, that's powerful. Now, once you discover your core message, and once you look back over your life, I want you to realize this. Anytime you're thinking about content, well, I don't know what to write. The most powerful piece of information and content generator that you have is your story. And when you realize that there is significance in every single moment of your life, significance, because the interesting part is when you discover your core message and you discover the things that keep happening in your life, the lessons that you keep learning, now what you'll realize is not only is your life teaching you, because now I can go back to my life, which is my curriculum. I have thousands of stories about lack of integrity, or I have thousands of stories of just embracing who you are, because I can look, my life is my curriculum. I don't need to read anybody else's book. I, those are byproducts. Those are great. Those are things that help anchor me and give me hope, right? But as far as me being able to share my story, I don't need anyone else's story to give me permission to share me. Because my permission was given to me long ago by life lived, experiences had. That's the only validation that I need. So when you see that there's significance in every event in your life and your core message has been speaking to you and your life has been speaking to you and feeding you the content and the characters and all the creativity you need, then what happens is, is that now the world opens up. So now not only do you see your core message and see your content in your history, in your story, now you see it in your present, your eyes are open to your life a little bit more. And you're also opening your eyes to the world around you. So now the world around you is speaking your core message. So you are just being consistently fed because sometimes we think, well, I don't know what to write. I know I have the gift of writing. I know I love to be creative. I sit down in front of my computer and I don't know what to write. When we take the chains off of the, the need just to create content, to create content and just get quiet with ourselves and understand that life is always trying to teach us and life is always giving us content, then we're, we write from a state of looking inward as opposed to seeing what everyone else is writing, right? Like I've seen people who are trying to build a writing business or even build a speaking business and they're always watching other people, the other, the other big names. And there's nothing wrong with that but that should be a byproduct because the person you watch the most is you because otherwise you're going to be you with the traces of all these other people when you don't need that. It is all in you. Now, <clears throat> when you are thinking of, when you're thinking of your story and you're thinking of what you want to write, not only are you focusing on what is my core message? How do I want to show up? The most important thing that you are thinking of is the audience that you are coming at. So you need to figure out, who am I writing to? Everybody has a different audience. I can't tell you how many times I sit down and I, I coach writers, and my first question is always, what's your avatar? Who are you writing to? And they say, well, I'm writing to everyone. Well, I'm sure you're not, right? If I'm writing about vulnerability, my audience is not five-year-olds, right? 
because if my audience was five-year-olds, the way that I would communicate vulnerability would be entirely different, right? So you've got to figure out who is my audience because now it takes the fear away from, will I be accepted? Because the reality is you're not going to be unconditionally accepted by everyone. Some people are going to read your stuff and not respect it. They're not going to like it. When I released my book, I kid you not. So the beginning of my book was very much memoir based. And it was like my heart on just on pages. It was like I bled out on these pages. And I remember when I released it and I self-published it. In the church I was going to, like the response, people loved it. They came up, oh my gosh, you were speaking to me. This book changed my life. Like you sharing your story made me feel like I was not alone. Like it's done so much wonders. And I'm like, oh my God, am I a best-selling author? <laughs> you know, like this is like amazing. And within a week, I had family members buying it off Amazon. And I'm a little terrified. And the response I got from the people who had known me, the people who had had a certain uh, visual of who I was and who they felt I should be and the message that I should have shared with the world, they hated it and they weren't ashamed to share it, you know? So I had a lot of negative feedback. And as a beginning writer, that devastated me because I was like, how could you, how could you hate my heart? Like this is, I shared something so vulnerable, but then as I've, as I've continued my writing journey, I, I realized that everybody doesn't have to get you. Everybody doesn't have to get your style and your message because you're not for everybody, but the people you are for, they will love you. They will support you. They will encourage you. And those are your people. And when you find your people, you hone in on them and you realize you are my people and I am you because the reality is, is that your target audience is going to look and sound a lot like you right? Because it's like you're sharing such intimate pieces of yourself that you're going to attract people who resonate with you. So now when you're thinking about what does my audience look like, what are they feeling? A lot like you. So now you're figuring out now when you're sharing your day to day, you're not afraid because you're like, oh, my audience is me. So if I'm feeling this or I'm having these issues in my current life, I can share without feeling awkward because I know my target audience, they resonate with me. So I'm doing what I was gifted to do, which I'm putting words to pain or to experiences that people cannot do, that they don't have the gift to do it. I've been given that gift. So now you also hone in on what makes you unique as a writer. What is it that you bring to the marketplace that not everybody is bringing? And then why is your message important? Why is it needed, right? Because so many times when it comes from taking the leap from being part-time to full-time is not feeling like you're enough, not feeling like what you have is important enough, not feeling like if I don't, if I don't have the degrees or I don't have the, I don't have the, the accolades. I'm going to tell you something. I have my degree in English education. I thought I was going to be an educator until the day I died. And I remember I was seven years in and I was so unhappy. And I, I know some of you resonate with this. When you're at a stage in your life and you know there's something more, right? But you don't know what that more is and you don't know how to get to that more. So you just stay in a situation that serves you, pays the bills and is comfortable. But all the while something inside of you is saying, Ugh, something more. So I'm, I'm, I'm at my seventh year teaching. I go home for Thanksgiving. My cousin's like, how's teaching? And I'm like, perfect. I'm going to leave. And she's like, what? Why? And I was like, I don't know. I just feel like there's something more. And she's like, what are you going to do? And I said, I have no idea. So I remember I, I went to a faculty meeting and that whole last year of teaching, just like something was like not settling well within me. And I remember this, one of the ladies stood up one of the teachers, and we were celebrating her retirement. And she stands up and we're clapping, 35 years, clapping for her. And I remember I couldn't even clap because I'm staring at this woman and I'm thinking, all life had left her face. That this environment, she's dead inside, but she's here and we're celebrating her retirement. And I remember her saying, um, I'm so excited. I want to travel the world. I've been putting it off. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to live my life. Right. 
And I remember I left teaching and two years later, one of the teach, one of my friends who was still teaching there, he called me and he was like, do you remember Miss So-and-so? And I was like, yeah. He was like, she dropped dead. Two years after her retirement. They don't know why she died. She just died. And in my head, I thought, how often do we pigeonhole ourselves to a certain job title, to a certain position, knowing that there's more inside of us, but we stay there and we let all this beautiful life inside of us just, just sit while we slowly give pieces of ourselves away and we don't follow what's in our heart to do. So when it comes to the standpoint of being qualified to be a writer, if you are human, if you have the capability to tap into your story, if you have the, if you have vulnerability and you have the ability to connect, then get yourself out there in whatever way imaginable. When you are looking at moving from where you're at now to where you wanna go, I wanna say a major thing that's going to stop you and I want to tell you, you need to throw this in the garbage every single day is trying to figure out the how. That is not your business. If I, if I say to you, two to three years ago, I'm sitting in the audience and saying, man, they really want to, they would love to speak at HothCon. If I had allowed the how to get in the way and tried to figure it out and control it and figure out well, what do I need to do and who do I need to be instead of just saying, man, if it's in my heart and I'm speaking it and I'm putting myself in the position to do it and to believe it, the how takes care of itself. I cannot say that enough. To describe how did I get from a high school classroom, teaching for seven years, knowing I was gonna retire, living in Clarksville, Tennessee, in a cult, and six years, six years later, I'm in St. Pete, I'm living in paradise, I've owned my own writing business for four years, I've published over 25 books, I don't know how the hell I got here. But I don't need to know the how, because my what and my why was so clear. So when you're doing your goals, your writing goals, I want you to establish these things because in order for you to get where you want to go as a writer, you got to see it in your mind. You got to be able to visualize it. You got to be able to see when you're waking up in the morning, what are you doing? Are you writing your book? Are you, are you doing another blog? Are you recording a podcast? What are you doing? See it even if it looks ridiculous. Once again, throw the how out the window. The how will take care of itself. So the first thing is, I call this your styleometry. You need to identify what is your style. So when I go to read certain authors, they have a style to them, right? So when I read Gary Vee's book, Gary Vee's book has a specific style because it's connected to how he communicates. Very raw, very simple, he uses a lot of curse words and it's very practically driven. That is his style. So now once he identifies his style, he shows up with that style on every single platform. I am accustomed to his voice because he's established it. So what is your style? Are you sarcastic in nature? Do you write in like a sarcastic way? Do you, do you tell stories? Do you like to tell personal stories all the time? Is that how your writing is? I know one author, he writes business books and his style is he takes business concepts and he writes fictional books. So he's teaching these business concepts, but he has fictional characters and he's built a platform off of that because he's identified his stylometry. What is your stylometry? Once you discover that, you show up with that same style. Second thing, what do you want to be known for? And this is connected to your core message. Whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, what are the messages that you are sending? Because here's the interesting thing. I feel like we've demonized fiction a lot because we're like, it's gotta be nonfiction. You gotta learn, you know, come to learn. But the interesting thing is I've learned more from fiction than I have from nonfiction, especially from a teaching standpoint. I think about so many of the fictional stories that I had my students read and we're sitting there diving deep into the hum human condi uh, condition. So are you somebody who loves to use fictional characters to teach? And if you're teaching, what are you teaching? What do you want to be known for? So if I pick up Sherry Rommel's book, 
is Sherry Rommel, is she somebody who's known for teaching forgiveness? Is that something that she has come to know in her life and she wants to teach that? Is if, if I'm reading, if I'm reading Stephanie's blog, is it all about budgeting? Is it all about finances? What do you want to be known for? The third thing is, is you need to establish a writing routine and you need to be as dedicated to that as you are to your nine to five. Now that sounds ridiculous because what if my writing routine's not paying me? Well, this is where we move from small minded thinking to believing that you are the creator of your reality. And whatever's in your reality right now, it's because your mind believes that's the only place it can go. So the way that we break that open is we, first of all, visualize ourselves. Where are you going? I saw myself here three years ago, right? And here I am. How? I don't know. I saw myself owning a business the minute I moved into St. Pete. I didn't know it was going to be a writing business, but I saw myself there. So your writing routine is telling yourself, I'm showing up for me before I'm showing up for my family, before I'm showing up for a paycheck, before I'm showing up for anyone else. Because I know if I show up for me first, then I show up better for everything else. We think it's backwards. Like I got to show up for all these people and then I'll, I'll give myself the crumbs. You deserve more than the crumbs. So show up for you. So like I said at the beginning, if, if writing is prayer, what does your space look like? Are you going to, do you have a mantra that, that you're going to say? I always give my, my clients, I give them a full mantra that they say before they ever start writing. And it's very much getting in alignment with yourself, thanking yourself for showing up, knowing that this moment is going to be a moment of creativity and that I'm not allowing blocks or my own small minded thinking or sometimes overthinking to stop me from just flowing. What's the place going to be? What spiritual practices? Are you going to do yoga beforehand? Are you going to meditate? How are you getting into your most effective creative space? Now, when you're thinking about your content, do you want to publish books? If you want to publish books, then what publications can you contact? What publishers? Do you want to get, do you want to get spot on magazines, uh, online publications? Make a list. How many submissions are you committing to doing a week? How many, um, how many pages are you committing to yourself to write per week? Right? Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna bookmark that to go to number five and tell you. I am a huge advocate of self-publish, self-publish, self-publish. You don't have to wait on a publisher to say, you're great. We want to publish. I don't have to wait on anyone to say that. I can test the marketplace right now by using something. I use this with all my clients. It's called Kindle Direct Publishing. It is automatically connected to Amazon. It's a free space. If I want to, if I want to write a book, and I have the manuscript right now, I can have it up on Amazon in 48 hours for free. Kindle Direct Publishing. That is one of the best places. You can publish journals on that. You can publish workbooks. I've done workbooks for retreats, workbooks for coaches on there. It is a print by demand site, which means that you pay at least 90% less than you're paying if you go to some of these places that print, right? So when you realize, when you take off the idea of, I have to wait for someone's approval, it's going to cost me a lot of money, and you realize you can be a content creator master and just start releasing your stuff out to the masses and test your, pub, test your audience, your audience then gets your book, and now you can say, well, I have a book out, maybe I want to create a course, or I have a book out, maybe I take that book and I do, um, I do Zoom meetings where we go through the chapters together, or I create my own book club. Take the limits off of your gift. We're creatives, right? We don't have to wait for anyone to tell us how to do it. The next thing is, this is really important. Connect to great editors. When you find a great editor, hold on to them for dear life. Send them gifts in the mail, send them flowers, because great editors are hard to come by. Everybody's an editor. You go online, people are charging pennies to the dollar to edit. Make sure you have a great editor because there is nothing that can destroy your credibility as a writer than poor grammar, punctuation, spelling. And some of us might stop ourselves by saying, well, I'm not good at any of those. That's why you have great editors. I have an editor and I edit. 
So I even contact other people because it, it, it benefits you having other eyes. So connect to great editors. Now, once you start dreaming, so this is the fun part, right? We're in dream mode. Now you think, I have my core message. I know who my audience is. I know what I want to do with it. I know that I want to self-publish a book this year, or I know that I want to um, start a blog this year, or I know that I want to start showing up differently on my social media so I can start building my audience or establishing my core message and getting my audience involved. Now you can just start making a content plan. And you know what the beautiful thing about all of these are? Is they are free to relatively dirt cheap, right? If you want to create a podcast today, free, you don't have to wait like we don't have to have a studio. You don't have to have a $300 microphone. You can start a podcast today. I use an app called Anchor. That app allows you to record. Yeah, Matt, you know what I'm talking about. Anchor is such a great resource because you can upload your stuff and it, it puts it directly on all podcast platforms for free. It's for free. YouTube, you can start a YouTube channel today for free. A book. You can write a book. And like I said, upload it to Kindle Direct Publishing. You can have it published within 48 hours. You can be a published author on Amazon. You can create a Kindle on Kindle Direct Publishing for free. You can create an ebook by making it a PDF and start just releasing it to people. Anything on social media that becomes a free place, test the market. So if you know, okay, this is my this is my content. I want to test it. I want to see how people respond. You can start on social media by just doing posts. And in those posts, how is your audience responding to it? What messages are they resonating with? Because that will help you get even more in tune with yourself and in tune with what your audience needs. Now, this is the most important part, and I'm going to wrap it up. The answers, the strategy, the healing, the inspiration, the tools, they're all found within your story. The thing that is holding us back the most is not lack of information. It's not lack of knowledge. We have Google, right? Anything you need to know and do, you can research right now. So the thing that usually holds us back is our own self-doubt and the belief that I'm not qualified enough. When I first started ghostwriting, my first book that I, that I did ghostwriting for, I did it for free, which when I look back now, I'm just horrified. I wrote a full book for free. And I remember when I did it, I didn't even know what ghostwriting was. I had just self-published my book and a friend had approached me and she said, I want to write a book. Here's what I have. I looked at it and I was like, I think I can do a better job. So then I was like, okay, here's, let's look at your story. Send me recordings of your story. Let me take it and I'll write it. And I wrote a full book and I was like, this is ghostwriting. So now I'm a ghostwriter. And then it went from there to somebody asking, hey, like you do, you do well with writing. Can you coach me? I didn't have a plan. I don't know how to be a writing coach. So I, yeah, of course I can do that. You know, and then go home, google.com. What is a writing coach and what do they do? And I took all best practice. Okay, here's some things that, that I can put together. Okay, here, now I'm still using me, but I'm also looking at the strategies that are already out there. Everything that I built was built on the fact that I believed that it was for me. I saw it and the universe just kept giving me opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Even sitting here as a speaker, I've been speaking since I was a child in the church, but to believe that I could speak outside of that environment and have something worth saying, it only started as a belief. I don't put myself out there as a speaker and try to get speaking engagements. Oh, I saw my screen. Um, I just believe that it is coming to me, right? So once again, the how doesn't have to present itself. Get so clear on your what, get so clear on your why, and get so clear on who you are and how you want to present yourself to the masses. Thank you so much. Claps all around, Amy. Thank you very much for, uh, for that. That was a, a really inspiring talk. We got a, a couple minutes here. We're just going to go a few minutes over. If there's any questions in the chat here, we can uh, 
open it up for a few if anyone has any for Amy. Uh, while those are coming in, though, I, I really loved what you said about uh, just throwing out the how, how to get there. I think I can relate to once you start trying to get over analytical on the steps you have to take, it can really just crush some dreams. <laughs> 100%. All right, let's check out the chat here. A uh, lot of love coming through. I don't see any questions yet. Uh, I did have one up top, though, from uh, Daniela saying, please share where we can buy your book once it is published. If you would want to share that, go for it. Yeah, so um, the book that I showed you is actually off the market because that book was written when I was really, really heavy in the church. Um, so there's so much dogma. So I decided to take it down because I didn't want that attached to my name. Um, but if you follow me on social media, I'm working on both a journal and a book. That was one of my challenges because I spend all my days and time publishing everybody else's stuff. And I really challenged myself this year as saying, like, I still want to incorporate my own stuff into, into the mix. So if you follow me on my social media channels, I'm looking to release it at the end of this year. And of course, I'm using Kindle Direct Publishing. I'm self-publishing because it is the best way to go. <laughs> well, awesome. A couple questions did come through here. One from Stephanie here. Uh, how do you go about getting ghostwriting clients? So this is a question I get a lot, and it's a, it's a tricky question. So the first thing that you would do is to, essentially, you need to brand yourself so people need to see you as a ghostwriter. And my suggestion to you is going to places like Upwork, Fiverr, places where people are looking for ghostwriting projects, but they're usually smaller, and they're usually going to be paying a little bit less. But those are places where you can kind of get your feet wet in it. Um, so you can figure out your process because every ghostwriter has a different process. And I will say this. Um, also, contact me as well because I can I use a lot of ghostwriters <laughs> in, in some of the projects that I have. But one of the main things is figuring out what's your process. So for me, I have my clients record everything. Some ghostwriters have their clients um, send them actual text that they have to manipulate. So that will help you figure out what process do you want to use. And then that puts experience under your belt, because then if you do well with them, they'll tell you about somebody else, somebody else. I'm a I've been a referral based business for four years. I every time I go to do a, a campaign, I get five referrals from people that I've already done business with. So that's really how you establish yourself as a ghostwriter who can now charge twenty thousand and thirty thousand dollars a project because you are getting those. Wow reviews and then people are then saying oh you got to get amy she does a great job mm -hmm. and you let your work then build your brand awesome okay question from naomi here how many hours a day do you spend writing great question um <laughs> so it just depends on the day now because writing is so emotion it can be so emotionally taxing especially the way that i teach it and the way that i believe it um so if I'm ghostwriting, I only allow myself to spend between two and two and a half hours each day on that project because I understand if I'm channeling someone, exhausting. I just mm -hmm. got done writing a book about a police officer who lived in, well, he still lives in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and he had a mental health breakdown while he was on the police force. And he was just done so unjustly. He was thrown into a psych ward and like, just his experiences were so heavy. So I'm writing this and I'm like, I'm channeling him being in a psych ward. That's not easy because I have to be in the psych ward with him and I got to be there. So I give myself a lot of grace and breaks. And that's why too, when I, when, when people co contract me, I always give myself more time than I think I need. So I'll usually give at least two to three weeks more. So I always tell them the latest is this so that I give myself appropriate breaks because if you try to like overwork yourself, writing becomes not pleasurable. So I give myself breaks in between the writing that I have to do and the clients that I'm using. So it just depends on workload deadlines. Um, but I definitely try not to do like an eight hour day of writing because literally my brain would go to mush and I wouldn't be a nice person to the people I love. Well, awesome. We have, uh, we have time for one more question and then we're going to uh, skip our break uh, I think we all got much more value out of this Q&A than the five-minute break. And then we're going to jump straight into Sean. So last question for Amy here. Uh, 
Where did it go? It was a good one. Do you suggest focusing on one thing at a time? This is from uh, Lingsley. Uh, I tend to have a habit of having multiple interests and not finishing and have time to focus on one thing at a time. How do you manage that? Such a great question, Lindsay. Obviously, the answer is yes. Focus on one thing at a time. I think sometimes with creatives, we suffer from analysis paralysis, right? Because we're creative, a lot of times creatives have like ADD. It's like, oh, I'm here. And then look at that shiny object. They want to go there. You know, I want to do this. And okay, I have the intro of my podcast together, but oh, I want to start a blog. So the I would suggest, this is what I do, um, when you have your task list for the day, I'm not a super organized person, but I've had to become it, is to set your intention of what is the project I'm working on, and you discipline yourself to finish that one project, because if not, like like this, Lindsay said, like you said, you're going to have 50,000 things half done, and nobody is benefiting from it, because they're just in your in your Word file, in your, um, in your folder, in your computer. So you get one thing done at a time and also get people in your life who are very much task driven, logic driven, and don't bend towards the creative side. I have at least two of them. They're very rude, but I need their rudeness. You know, I need them to hold me accountable. So I'll say, hey, I'm working on this project. I just need you to make sure that I am sticking with it. So ask me on this day what what have I accomplished? And just having that accountability helps me to know, okay, this person's going to ask me, I need to stay on track. Um, Because if you have a whole lot of other creatives who are ADD, you're just, once again, you're going to have a full folder of all this goodness that the only person that's benefiting from it are, you know, big brother behind the, um, behind Microsoft Word and our laptops. Well, thank you very much, Amy. I know there's a couple questions we didn't get to, but we can always uh, reach out to her later after the presentation. So thank you, Amy. We'll let you get going and enjoy the rest of your, uh, your Tuesday here.